Hi, welcome to this roundtable discussion. I'm joined by Drago Radev, who's a com prof prof professor of computer science at Yale University, and Jonathan Bisk, an assistant professor of computer science at the Language Technology Institute at CMU. Um, we've had two um, brilliant talks uh, by them in which they both um, presented really interesting research on natural language processing um, and also multimodal um, analysis combining computer vision and, and NLP. And also in, in both of their talks, they presented new um, data sets. And so I wanted to start there um, and a question to, to both of our, our speakers um, based on those those data sets that you um that you created what were the main sort of motivations um and limitations you saw in the current data sets that that drove you to 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 create those just to summarize um we'll start with uh drago okay yeah uh, thank you daniel so uh, our lab is actually quite well known for generating a lot of nlp data sets and uh, many of them are really highly respected. So the, the biggest data set that we created a couple of years ago is called SPIDER. You heard about it earlier today. Uh, it is currently probably one of the largest and most well-known data sets in semantic parsing for database access. So the reason why we created it is that the current state of the art at the time we did it 2018 was that there was only one big data set, WikiSQL from Salesforce. And that was only covering uh, single tables and not joins across different tables. We didn't have any complicated queries, any nested queries, any aggregate queries. So uh, my student, Tao Yu, who recently finished his PhD here and started as an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong, uh, created this data set along with 10 other students from the lab. And uh, it took us more than six months to clean it up and to make it publicly available. But we've been very happy because the leaderboard on papers with code is currently teeming with submissions from all over the place. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Jonathan, the, the web QA um, data set, do you mind kind of summarizing and, and sharing what motivated you to, um, to create that? Yeah, so I think I think that it really builds a little on what Drago was saying about this push towards aggregation and reasoning, right? So it's this sort of notion that you want benchmarks that are requiring that kind of skill set. And then in particular, in our context, as opposed to, for instance, structured knowledge, um, we're looking at sort of the siloing that has existed between the vision and language communities. And so if I have access to information in any modality, I should be able to articulate it. And so it's a question of how do we move ourselves towards models that are able to do that kind of aggregation cross modality. Yeah, and to build off that, um, you wrote uh, in, uh, or you, you spoke about in the, in the um, talk about you know, unifying a multimodal reasoning model to sort of seamlessly transition um, uh, between different different uh, source modalities like images and 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 language. Um, do you think that transformers, for example, are somehow fundamentally limited in the way that they can do that? Or are you hoping just to sort of push that research to basically yeah. deal with this better? <clears throat> no, it, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think that there's, I want to I wanna separate two aspects. I want to separate sort of the transformer as a machine learning framework and then the implementations of it that we've seen. And so I think that there is perhaps a fundamental limitation to the way that it's being deployed. So we, I think, have, have historically, and I say historically as in the last two to three years, um, seen this kind of a focus on like getting a vision system to produce um, a pretty small set of natural language labels and then assuming that we can sort of reason from there. But that's a very limited um, notion of the world and it's a very limited notion of what vision actually has access to. And so the transformer that we're currently seeing is oftentimes of that form. It's sort of take a pre-trained uh, limited vision system and then sort of hope that we can do something with its output. There has been some work in the last year, I think VILT and some other models like this, which are really starting to change that paradigm where um, vision is a first class member um, alongside language. And I think that really does start to open this question about like, what does it mean to build a truly multimodal representation, have a single um, sort of part of the embedding space that's both an apple as everything you would see and also all of the sort of textual knowledge implications, you know, recipes or whatever that you might have. And so that's, that's very much the focus. So it's, I wouldn't necessarily say that the model itself is limited, but the way that we've deployed them uh, hasn't quite gotten there yet. 
Thanks. And and Draco, um, you, you mentioned that many people were using your data sets and the leaderboards were really competitive. Uh, what do you feel are the most um, exciting, you know, what, where's the most exciting progress coming in, in terms of achieving those results based on, on the data sets that you've released? Well, not surprisingly, uh, you know, the most recent transformer models have outperformed the previous systems by quite a lot. We saw a huge uh, jump in the quality of the systems around the time that we submitted our data set to the website. Uh, more recently, there have been also mostly uh, marginal improvements, and I think that it's time to wait for the next big thing that will come out. Hopefully, I'm hoping something that is a combination of uh, neuro and symbolic methods. Yeah, if I can, if I can sort of just jump on, like I think, I think this is this is like the key insight, right? And Drago is obviously sort of a leader here, but um, it's this notion that reasoning is not necessarily the same thing as sort of copying, or uh, which is what a lot of these models are doing. Um, or kind of sort of paraphrase kind of things where we're sort of looking for sort of these simple equivalences in the data. If you actually have to create new data because you, for instance, are reasoning across something, then the symbolic representations are the way that we do it. So, it, you know, in terms of if we're writing it down, and so it seems natural that we would want to be moving to models that also have that kind of ability. Yeah, may I add one more thing? So uh, the amount of data that we have is obviously huge, but it doesn't grow at the rate that we really want to build better models. Uh, there is always a long tail of things that we have never seen before, you know, just once or maybe even zero times. I think that the only way that we can deal with this long tail is through some sort of very clever compositionality, so that if you can solve some simpler versions of the problem, uh, which appear much more frequently, and then you find a clever way to combine them, you should be able to cover a lot more of the long tail. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really... Um, interesting challenge and I, I think even more potentially more extreme in the case of multimodal at these you know multimodal contexts um, do you do you foresee there be in the near term being more research pushing beyond image and language and, and thinking about um, that there's been some interesting work just driving models directly from speech data, for example. Um, Jonathan, are you exploring yeah. any, any modalities beyond? Um, yeah, so so it's so I I it's one of those things where it's like what I want to do, what's practical, what's there's sort of like all these versions of that, right? But I but I think yeah, the one in particular that I tend to think a lot about is the as a modality is action. So I think if I can build on sort of uh, Drago's comment about the tail, there's sort of the scope of things that have been written about, which is smaller than the space of knowledge. It's, you know, so you have the, the, the scope of things that have been photographed, the scope of things that have been recorded, the scope of things that have been spoken, but that's all still smaller than the space of all things. And if you have an agent, the way that a human interacts with the world that can actually explore and sort of take actions in order to figure out where its knowledge representation is too weak, um, you know, you can even imagine some simple sort of physics kinds of domains. Uh, that's, I think, that piece that's really, that's really missing, that sort of curiosity that allows you to choose. But that, that kind of choose your own adventure style model also brings with it a ton of other challenges, right? The beauty of static data sets is that they are kind of constrained and we can sort of iterate on them and things like that. The second that there is this sort of um, ability to change the data that you're seeing, you have a moving target. And so that, that transition, I think, is super important, but also super hard. Yeah, I completely agree with Jonathan. And another modality that we should explore more, as we all know, is the video. So there has been a lot of very interesting work in the last few years from the University of Washington and Illinois and Microsoft and other places on uh, exploiting actions that are described in videos. So you just watch somebody you know, cook some uh, dish and then you want to understand what are the different steps and how you combine things, how do you prepare you know, the final result. That's great. And, and we, we only have a short time here for this conversation, unfortunately, but just want to end on, um, you know, building off what um, you, you just said about, you know, what's, you know, you have to sit at this place where what's, you know, doing what's practically possible as well as what's, you know, exciting and, and can drive a research forward. But say, say, say you didn't have those constraints, um, what would, what would the things that you think would be most helpful to really push 
the state of the art be um, both in 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 um, you know passing of, of of databases as well as as sort of um, uh, the, the multimodal analysis. I'll give you a very short and very probably unexpected answer. Uh, I really believe that we need uh, some philosophers. Uh, to join this kind of projects who can help us understand the world in a different way uh, through a different lens from what has been around in the last few thousand years. I'll get my one my one word answer is robots. Um, we need embodiment. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan and Drago. Really appreciate your time and both of your presentations and uh, for this, this conversation. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.